Uh, so yesterday we focused on the topic of what we buy. Uh, today we're going to turn our attention to food, farming and land use. And it's at this point we also welcome our online viewers back. So welcome to the, uh, to the live stream as well. Uh, so over the course of this morning, we're going to have we're going to hear from six speakers. We're going to do it a little bit differently to to the way that we did it yesterday, just based on a bit of feedback from you and from the table facilitators as well. So after each speaker speaks, we're going to give you uh, around about eight or nine minutes on your table, just to have a conversation about what they've said and think about the questions that you want to to put to them. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the uh, the Q and A uh, a bit later, again they're going to be at your table, so you'll have a decent amount of time to have a conversation with them uh, then. Uh, just a reminder that you've got the yellow and red cards. So if a speaker is speaking too fast, then hold up a yellow card. If, uh, if you have kind of missed the, the last point that a speaker has made, then hold up a red card and they will repeat it for you. Uh, so we have uh, six fantastic speakers uh, today to, to talk to us about food farming and land use. And our uh, first speaker is uh, Indra uh, Tidanathan from the Committee on Climate Change. She's going to give us an introduction to the topic of food, farming and land use. So over to you, Indra. Good morning. How is everyone today? It's a bright and sunny morning. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. So I work for the Committee on Climate Change and I'm the Agriculture and Land Use Analyst and I work on how the sector can reduce emissions and its contribution to achieving the net zero goal by 2050. So first I thought I'd give a couple of contextual slides on the importance of agriculture in the UK in terms of how much land it uses, the, its contribution to the UK economy, and also the amount of food that's produced that we consume. So first looking at the area of land, as you can see from this pie chart, Agriculture actually takes up more than 70% of the UK land area and most of that is in grassland and then we've got some land area to grow crops. So this is crops both for feeding humans but also to grow crops for animal feed. And then woodlands takes up another 13% but as you can see from the grade area, Urban area, such as cities and road infrastructure, actually takes up quite a small percentage, only about 8%. In terms of um, agriculture's contribution to the UK economy, it's quite a small proportion. So in 2018, it accounted for just less than 1% of gross domestic product or GDP. Um, if we look at the bottom set of uh, bullets, in terms of the labour force, how many, how many people are actually employed in agriculture, Again, this is quite a low proportion, around 1.5% 1, 1, 1 of the UK labour force. So less than half a million. So agriculture ha offers quite a low contribution to the UK economy, but in terms of the amount of food that's actually produced, it's quite significant. So this first chart actually shows you, of the food that we consume in the UK, how much of it is actually produced within the UK by UK farmers. So the top line looks at indigenous food types. So this is the sort of food that we can grow in our climate. So it obviously excludes things like avocados or bananas. So you can see by 2018, roughly three quarters of the food we consumed in the UK, that's indigenous type food, is produced domestically. And the rest is imported. Um, the, the bottom line, the blue line, if we widen the amount of the type of food we consume to include things like bananas, avocados, kiwi fruit, for example, you can see that our, um, the amount of food that we do produce that is then consumed in the UK falls to it's bobbling around the sort of 60 60 percent share. I'm sorry, I, I don't understand what you said there. Right. So, so what this? Do you understand the concept of the chart or? No, no, no. So the, the red line looks at the type of food that our climate can produce. So it excludes the more exotic tropical food. So of the food that we're able to produce in, in this climate, we roughly produce 75% of the total food that's consumed in the UK. So the remaining 25% is imported. The bottom line includes all food types that we consume in the UK. And obviously, we can't, there's a lot of, lot of fruit we can't produce in the UK because we don't have the climate. Hence why that bottom line is a bit lower. So in 2018, it's about 
if we look at, um, the, hopefully this chart might make things a bit clearer. So if we look at the product type, so the blue corresponds to um, um, plant-based type foods and the orange bar charts corresponds to different types of meat. You can see for wheat, for example, um, roughly 85% of the wheat that we consume is produced in this, in this country, in the UK, and the rest is imported. Fresh vegetables, it declines slightly, and fruit, you can see it, 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 it's quite low. It's less than, ooh, less than 20%, and again, that's because we import a lot of exotic tropical foods that we simply can't grow in this country. And if you look at beef, veal, pig meat, and poultry, um, self-sufficiency there varies. So pig meat is a bit lower than the other two, and we import quite a lot of bacon, for example, from, from Denmark. So imports account for roughly 47% of the food we consume. We also export about 18% of the food we produce. And if we look at all the food that's exported, so both food for humans, animal feed, and drink, it makes up about less than 2% of global agricultural export flows. So now looking at the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that's actually emitted within UK agriculture, we can see from this chart it's the sixth largest emitter in 2017. So it's the green line. And we account, and UK agriculture accounts for less than 10% of UK agriculture, uh, total UK emissions. And we can see by this green line it's been broadly flat, so we've seen no real decrease in the last 10 years. Now if we look at the main sources of uh, agricultural emissions, the, the biggest source of emissions is, comes from the digestion process of cattle and sheep. So this is you know, the burping that's talked about, the burping of methane. And this is because cattles have, um, cattle and sheep have more than one stomach, which is needed to digest grass. But this actual process emits quite a lot of methane. And that can vary by feed type and also by cattle type. Second largest source is the emissions that's generated from managing our soils, our agricultural soils. And that accounts for roughly a quarter of UK agricultural emissions. And the two largest sources there are the application of fertilizer on grassland, on cropland. So fertilizer can either be chemical fertilizer or organic fertilizer, which is the manures you get from livestock. The third largest source Roughly 15% of agricultural emissions comes from the storage and management of manure. So you can imagine, you know, a dairy farm will generate a lot of manure. That has to be managed and stored, but that in itself would generate emissions. And the fourth um, uh, source, bigger source, just roughly 10% comes from tractors. So diesel, that's a big source of emissions. And also the equipment needed to heat it, you know, to heat anim, um, livestock um, buildings for pigs, for example, but also the cooling and drying systems. Uh, if we look at the different types of greenhouse gases, we can see that methane accounts for over half of all UK agricultural emissions and nitrous oxide a further 31%. Now, due to the complex biological and chemical processes associated with crop and livestock production, it is not possible to actually reduce these emissions to zero. So at best, we can reduce these, but it will be very difficult to get them down to zero unless a big technological breakthrough comes, comes in. But there are ways we can actually get farmers to adopt different practices on how they farm the land that can reduce emissions. So the first one looks at the digestion process I talked about. So the different animal feeds that can be fed to cattle that will help in reducing methane. We can also improve animal health. Um, also in terms of soils, farmers can be more efficient in the amount of fertilizer that's applied on soils, which will reduce the nitrous oxide emissions. And in terms of managing and storing animal waste, um, if we add, slurry to slurry, add acid to slurry stores, that can reduce emissions again. And in terms of energy use, switching away from diesel and fossil fuels to renewables can reduce emissions that way as well. And beyond reducing emissions, we also get other environmental benefits from adopting these practices. There are improvements in water quality. So if we reduce the amount of nitrogen that's applied on land, less of it gets washed into the rivers and streams. So it, water quality is improved. Also air quality, 
Agriculture is a larger source of ammonia emissions, which is quite damaging to, to human health. So if we can improve on that, we can get better air quality. Improvements in animal health, soil quality, and increasing biodiversity. So that's looking at what farmers can do to reduce agricultural emissions, but there's also a role for us as consumers in deciding the options and the choices of what we eat. So if we eat less beef, lamb and dairy, that can also contribute to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can see from this chart, when looking at the animal protein sources, they have a much higher emissions attached to that unit of protein. So this chart is looking at the unit of protein and how much emissions is attached to each unit. So at the extreme left, you see beef has the highest emissions intensity. And then as you go along the chart to the right, you can see that generally, you know, pigs and poultry has less. And then when we get down to peas, for example, that's, that's a very small element there. But when we do eat beef, lamb and dairy, it's important that we eat uh, products that have the lowest emissions intensity. So this chart shows you um, from across the globe the emissions intensity of beef. So we can see that the UK does actually quite well in terms of having the lowest emissions intensity of, of beef production. So we don't, you know, if we want to reduce our meat consumption, we can do that, but it's important where we also, what, where that beef comes from. So you can see Brazil and Indonesia has quite a high emissions intensity, and a lot of that is due to deforestation, you know, take the trees down in order to graze animals. So that's looking at agriculture. This is now looking at the way we manage and change the use of land, which is also important for reducing emissions and improving, um, improving uh, our net carbon sink. And again, there are ways we can do this. Planting more trees, also planting them on farm, energy crops, and re restoring peatlands. And there, again, there are also a wider set of benefits attached to doing all of this. Um, so my next set of speakers are going to go into this in much more detail. So the first set of speakers are going to look at the role of farming in delivering net zero. Then we've got Joe House that's going to talk about the ability of land to deliver net zero as well. And then thirdly, the last two set of speakers are going to talk about more of the behavioural side, looking at diet change as well. Thank you very much.